Hello, everyone. Welcome to Penn Faulkner's second literary conversation of the 2020 fall season. We're talking tonight about virus. My name is Beth Ann Patrick. I'm the Programs Committee Chair for Penn Faulkner, and I am so excited to welcome you all here tonight. We've got a stellar panel for you, but a few things before I introduce the panelists. For those of you joining us for the first time, what you should know about Penn Faulkner is that we are a nonprofit literary organization based in DC with a mission of celebrating literature and fostering connections between readers and writers to enrich and inspire individuals and communities. We fulfill this mission by administering two national literary awards, the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction and the Penn Malamud Award for Excellence in the Short Story, as well as through our educational programs, which bring free books and author visits to DC public and public charter schools. Our literary conversations, of course, is it's, you know, sort of fun side of programming. And we're on a virtual platform for the second time and just delighted to welcome people from all around the country tonight. A couple of notes about the webinar. There will be a short Q&A session at the end of the event, so please submit your questions using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. You can also upvote favorite questions, for instance, if someone's asked what you want to hear already. We'll do our best to get to them in the time we have. We're very proud to have adopted a pay what you will model for these literary conversations in order to increase accessibility to our programs during these uncertain and troubled times. If you're able, please consider making a donation to us through the link we'll put up in the chat. Any amount you give will go directly towards programming and our programs and schools for audiences across the country as well. We'd also like to thank Politics and Prose, our book selling partner for these events. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to tonight's three panelists for Virus. Lauren Bukes is, as well as the author of Afterland, her latest novel, the author of the critically acclaimed Broken Monsters, an international bestseller, The Shining Girls, Zoo City, which won a 2011 Arthur C. Clarke Award, and Moxie Land. She worked as a journalist and a showrunner on a really big animated TV show in South Africa. And she's also worked on an award-winning documentary and wrote Ferris, The Hidden Kingdom, which is a New York Times bestselling graphic novel. She lives in Cape Town, South Africa, and she's joining us from a time of 1 a.m., so we are really grateful to Lauren tonight. Next, we have Emma Donahue, who is a two-time Irish emigrant. First, she went and got her PhD at Cambridge University in England, and then she moved to Ontario, to London, Ontario, where she lives with her partner and their two children. She also migrates between genres, from literary history, to biography, to short stories and fairy tales, and many other things. She's known for her novels, which range from the historical, like Slammerkin, The Sealed Letter, to contemporary books like Landing and Stir Fry, and maybe best known to many people who are watching tonight for Room, which was a New York Times bestselling book of 2010 and a finalist for the Man Booker, Promonwealth, and Orange Prizes. And she's here tonight to discuss, among other things, her latest novel, The Pull of the Stars. So great to have Emma with us as well. Finally, well, not finally, but finally of the three panelists, we have Stephen King. We're so excited to have him with us tonight. He was born in Portland, Maine. He was brought up in Durham, Maine, and he's with us tonight from Maine. He divides his time between two towns in that state, Bangor and Center Stovall, and he spends his winters in Florida, that lucky duck. He of course, is the best-selling uh, author of many novels that I'll list in just a second. But he and his wife, Tabitha Spruce, also have three children about whom they are just crazy. Um, Naomi Rachel, Joe Hill, and Owen Phillip. They also have four grandchildren, but I should mention that everyone in the King family is a writer of some sort, all the members of the family. So, um, 
carry uh, was not his first major success, but it was published in 1973. And that was the book that allowed Stephen King to leave any other kind of work behind and work as a novelist full time. So his career since 1973 has only gotten bigger and better. Um, he left Maine for Colorado for a short time, but it was a very fruitful time. That's when King wrote both The Shining and The Stand. So we're gonna be talking, I'm sure, about The Stand tonight. Um, now he is providing scholarships for local high school students, contributing to many local and national charities. He's the 2003 recipient of the National Book Foundation Medal for Distinguished Contribution to American Letters and the 2014 Medal of Arts. There's so many things that he's done and I know that this bio is not doing him justice, but I hope that he will forgive me for that. Finally, our moderator is another great friend here for Penn Faulkner, Daniel Pink. He's the author of six provocative books about business and human behavior. They include longtime best-selling New York Times bestsellers, When and A Whole New Mind, as well as the number one New York Times bestsellers, Drive and To Sell is Human. His books have won multiple awards and been translated into 41 languages and have sold more than 3 million copies. He lives in Washington, D.C. with his family. And now I'm going to ask you, Daniel Pink, to take it away for a conversation about virus. Okay, thanks, Beth Ann. Um, let's talk about virus or viruses. Um, and let's bring on our distinguished panel who have already been introduced. Uh, I see Lauren is on and Emma is on. We're just waiting for Steve. Maybe the connections are, there he is, all the way from me. So here's, so, um, so uh, thank you for that lovely introduction, Beth Ann. Thanks to everybody out there for joining us today. Um, and thank you to Penn Faulkner for what you do to promote reading, to promote literature. Uh, to promote the life of the mind. Thanks also to uh, my local independent bookstore, Politics and Prose, here in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Um, if you want to order any of these great books, order them from Politics and Prose. So let's get started here to talk about viruses, but let's, let's get a sense of where our panelists are, uh, both uh, geographically and emotionally. So what I'd like to do is, is go around the horn and, and, say, and ask each of you, um, what has living through this pandemic been like for you uh, and how has it affected your writing life? Let's start with the person furthest away, at least from me, which is Lauren in South Africa. Um, it's been rough, um, but I mean, you know, I, I'm, I have a, ho a house, I have a home, I have all the food I need to eat, I have an income, so it's been okay. But South Africa faced a very, very hard lockdown. At one point, we were living through a prohibition where you weren't allowed to buy alcohol, which I understand because it lowered like trauma cases at the emergency room. But you mm. also weren't allowed to buy cigarettes, which didn't make any sense, especially because that's such a taxation, you know, uh, benefit. So it's been very strange. People have masked up early. Uh, we've been really good about that, uh, mostly. Um, and it's not politicized, so it's really strange to see what's happening in the States right now, um, to see people fighting over a mask. And what about your day-to-day -day life doing your work as a writer? Oof, um, I've been struggling to write, but I've started getting back into it. I think it's also like trying to get back into a routine. I moved house in the middle of the pandemic. I've got a 12-year-old kid, so all of those parents out there, you know, just how bad Zoom schooling is and the horror of that. Um, she's now back at school, and it looks like our schools are okay, so that's been good. And I'm getting back into the writing. Um, it took me getting back into reading to be able to get back into writing. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, fantastic. So let's go to let's go to Emma uh, in Ontario. Uh, where in Ontario are you? I'm in London, Ontario, which is in London, between... in London, Ontario. Um, yeah, so... halfway between Detroit and Toronto. We're in the little dangly bit, you know. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> the the differences between Detroit and Toronto in response to this pandemic, though, is far greater than the geographic distance. But Emma, so um, so what has the pandemic been like for you? How has it affected your day-to-day -day writing life? I'm really sheepish to admit that it's been fine. 
you know um I, of course i've missed travel and all that but daily life has been fine our city has not had it bad canadian social cohesion and compliance i've never felt more grateful for you know i've never feared that people were going to be uh you know coming past the house with flaming torches so um things have been good and i'm um so enjoying writing a musical because uh you know i'm so sad about theater being currently dormant that i feel writing a a big budget musical and promising myself that a time will come where it could be theoretically put on to a huge crowd of people. It's like Are you writing the music myself. and the- No, and I'm not. I'm writing, I'm writing the words only. The words, okay. The words, the skeleton. So that's, that's, amb that's, that's, uh, that's ambitious for a, uh, writing a musical for a pandemic. Is, is it about, is it about- No, is it it's a not about pandemic. pandemic. No. no, it's a complete break from the pandemic. Okay. Um, so finally, um, it, dangerously close to Canada in Maine is uh, is Stephen King. Stephen, how, um, how have you been faring during the pandemic? How has it affected your day-to-day -day life? Well, writers self-isolate anyway when they're working on a book. And when this thing hit, uh, I was working on a book and I was having a, a kind of a tough sled, I'd say, w with it. And uh, all at once, um, the country locked down, I think, uh, reluctantly by our, our president, um, uh, who kind of had to weigh dead bodies against the economy and kind of came down on the side of the economy for uh, way too long. But uh, <clears throat> the thing ab about the pandemic and being isolated was that uh, all at once, my book started to go much better because I had really had no distractions except mm -hmm. for streaming services like Netflix and Hulu on TV. To me, the interesting uh, difference uh, and the reason why uh, there has to be, God, please, some kind of national mandate on how to deal with this thing, starting with masks and going on to social distancing, was <clears throat> when it got heavy uh, when it really started to come down and get bad. I was in Florida and going to the supermarket in Florida in February and going to the supermarket here in Western Maine in July and August were entirely different uh, responses. Uh, the social distancing was enforced. Uh, there were actually lanes in the in the supermarket, like one way streets. All yeah. way didn't go two ways you had to follow and uh everybody here was wearing masks and uh i'm very uh careful about that because my daughter is immune deficient so we have to be careful of her and frankly my wife and i are no spring chickens i know i look like tom cruise and uh at 25 but it's uh when you get older it's a little bit tough you have to be careful sure okay so um, well, I'm glad that all of you seem to be faring reasonably well. Some of you are getting some of you are getting work done, which is always which is always. I know that for any writer, it's always a struggle. But in a, with a with a double layer of um, the pandemic, it's a double struggle. So what we want to do here is uh, what we're going to do is all of these people. What a stroke of luck! Have written novels that have to do with viruses. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to have each of them read a short section of their book. Um, and then we'll talk about why do we write about viruses? Why do we write about illnesses? What does it tell us about the human soul? What does it tell us about storytelling? And what we're going to do, um, so fascinating that these books, um, we're going to go chronologically. So let's start, Emma, with you, this wonderful book, uh, The Pull of the Stars. Um, which has allowed me to dine out on the factoid of where the word influenza comes from uh, for many months. Um, Emma, why don't you uh, set up the, the reading that you're going to give us and then, and then read away. Sure. It's, um, it's Dublin, um, the beginning of November 1918, and a doctor called Kathleen Lynn and um, a nurse, Julia Power, are doing an autopsy on, on a freshly dead patient of Julia's. Pregnant women have sky high morbidity even for weeks after birth, said the doctor, which suggests their defenses have been weakened somehow. I thought of the old tale of Troy, weak soldiers dropping out of the wooden horse's belly under cover of night and throwing open the gates. 
betrayed by one's own side. What was it Dr. Lynn had quoted to me about us all living in an unwalled city? She cut now, she scooped. I labeled, I bagged. She grumbled. So many autopsies being industriously performed all over the world, nurse power, and just about all we've learned about this strain of flu is that it takes about two days to incubate. Aren't they any closer to a vaccine then? I asked. She shook her head and her loose braid leapt. No one has even managed to isolate the bacterium on a slide yet. Perhaps the little bugger is too small for us to see. We'll have to wait for the instrument makers to come up with a stronger microscope, or possibly it's some new form of microbe altogether. I was bewildered by this and daunted. All rather humbling, she added ruefully. Here we are in the golden age of medicine, making such strides against rabies, typhoid fever, diphtheria, and a common or garden influenza is beating us hollow. No, you're the ones who matter right now. Attentive nurses, I mean. Tender, loving care. That seems to be all that's saving lives. And Thank you. So what's, uh, what's extraordinary about this novel, which came out, what, Emma, what, uh, just a few months ago, right? In July. In yeah. July. It, was meant, it was meant to come out next year. Well, there's an, there's, a, there's an author's note. You have a book that's set in, the, in Dublin in 1918 during the, another epidemic. And in the author's note, you t tell us about your thinking, why you set your novel in that sure. time. Yes, and then, and then tell, us, tell us a little bit about the decision to um, get it out in, the, in this red hot moment here. Yeah, it's, it's pure fluke, I'm afraid. I, I wrote it in 2018, inspired by the centenary of the 1918 flu pandemic with no thought of contemporary relevance at all. I just thought it sounded like an interesting cultural moment to write about, you know, the kind of almost post-apocalyptic atmosphere of a modern plague, you know, a modern electrified city grinding to a halt. So um, I finished it in 2019, sold it to my publishers, and they said, oh, let's try and avoid the Trump election as a publishing season. Let's publish it in early 2021. And I said, fine, fine. So I delivered it on the 3rd of March this year. And then I kind of, looked up and noticed the headlines, but I still didn't link it to my book. You know, a book is like this little private madness, you know? And then my publishers <laughs> about the start of April got in touch and said, let's rush it out in July, you know? As it's finished, all we have to do is copy edit it. Um, and I'm very lucky I have a copy editor at, at Little Brown anyway, who is an emergency room doctor. So she quickly put my medical mistakes through the ringer. And um, I also hired a midwife to give me that perspective too. Oh. And they brought it out in July. So the whole thing's been a bit of a shock for me. Yeah. And, and yeah, I didn't, I didn't add anything contemporary. The only thing I changed was that in the writing of the book, I had used the word epidemic, even though it was a pandemic, because pandemic seemed like a bit of jargon that only scientists would use, you know. But by the end of March, pandemic was just the most routine word. So that's the only thing I changed. Yeah, I mean, speaking speaking of words, I mean, I, I have to say I was fascinated by um, wh where the title comes from because the title comes from the very word influenza. Tell us about that, and then we'll move on to uh, yeah. To Steve. Well, the story goes that it's um, medieval Italy, and they believed the flu was caused by the influence of the stars. So, so literally, the influence of stars on us, um, and of course, you know, a title's a, a dangerous choice because as soon as I had chosen the pull of the stars. I realized I'd have to have a scene where you could see some stars that I've never seen on a roof. So everything followed from there. And it's also a little nod to um, Sean O'Casey's play, The Plough and the Stars, because that oh. was my first thing I ever saw set in the Dublin slums, where most of the patients in this book come from. Right, which is, I think, important in understanding pandemics and viruses and so forth. Thank you, Emma. Okay, so let's move on. So we're going to move through time. We're in Dublin in 1918 now. Let's move to Steve um, and the stand. The stand, uh, which is uh, which came out. Uh, well, I want to talk about this for a moment, Steve. But but uh, came out originally in this. The, the, came out originally in 1978, I think. Yeah, that's um, all right. So, and, and so so we're so we're moving to sort of uh, uh, 20th century America and the. Well, what ends up being the charred landscape of 20th century America. So, Steve, why don't you? Um, I know which like I know which uh, which scene you picked, which I freaking love. So, why don't you uh, set that up for us and read it for us, please? Well, actually, Daniel, I changed my mind. I'm going to read the oh. whole book. Okay. <laughs> right. Well, that will. That, yeah. There's so, a, um, a, it'll we'll we'll set it. We'll go to Guinness and the long. It'll be the longest 
Zoom conference ever in the history of humankind. I mean, I, I've enjoyed this book because I get like a little workout each time I pick it up. Yeah. <laughs> Reminds me of a critic's uh, description of a James Michener book where he said, I have two pieces of advice. The first is don't read it. The second is if you do read it, don't drop it on your foot. Uh, anyway, the, the, the stand is about a super flu uh, virus and uh, there's a patient zero who escapes a, uh, a bio warfare laboratory. His name is Charles Campion and uh, he gets sick. He crashes at a gas station in Texas. Uh, the people there are infected except for one of the protagonists. But the person who interested me was uh, a state trooper who stops by and uh, the state trooper becomes a vector like whoever left Washington state uh, after coming in from China. There has to be a vector. Once it gets out, uh, you're in very bad trouble. So this is a reading. Uh, he has, the, the cop, uh, Joe Bob, has stopped uh, a salesman um, for speeding and let him go with a warning. And the salesman's name is Harry Trent. Harry Trent stopped at a Texas cafe called ba ba Babe's Quick Eat for lunch. He had a slight cold and he had to keep sneezing and to spit. In the course of the meal, he infected Babe, the dishwasher, two truckers in the corner booth, the man who came in to deliver the bread and the man who came in to check, change the records on the juke. He left with the sweet thing that waited on his table, a tip that was crawling with death. On his way out, a station wagon pulled in. The driver who rolled down his window to ask Harry how to get to US 21 going north had a New York accent. Harry gave the New York fellow very clear directions on how to get to Highway 21. He also served the New York fellow and his entire family their death warrants without knowing it. That night, the New York family stayed in a Eustis, Oklahoma travel court. Ed and Trish infected the clerk. The kids infected the kids they played with on the tourist court's playground. Kids bound for West Texas, Alabama, Arkansas, and Tennessee. His wife, Trish, infected the two women who were washing clothes at the laundromat two blocks away. Ed, on his way down the motel corridor to get some ice, infected a fellow he passed in the hallway. Everybody got into the act. Was the word super spreader around in, when you first wrote this? No. No, but that's what it is. It's really quite remarkable. And the virus in your book is a, is a, is a deadly virus. I mean, it's essentially a death sentence for everybody who contracts it. Instead of super spreader, I, I called that chapter chain letter. Uh, which is the way a chain letter works. You, you get one and you send it to seven people and those seven each send it to seven more. So it's 49 and it's supposed to go that way. And chain letters don't work, but a chain letter like COVID-19 or the, the super flu in this book, they work just fine. Now, I, I, I'm, not, I'm curious about what the, the, if there was any impetus beyond telling an amazingly good story in that book. And, and I'll tell you, I, this is something that's been, I've been thinking about for a while. I'm going to show my age and I'm going to take the, the opportunity to ask this question. I remember, I'm old enough to remember that like in the late 1970s, there was something called Legionnaire's disease, which mm -hmm. seemed like a horrible, in the United States, like this, it, did, it ended up killing maybe a few dozen people, if I'm not mistaken. But it was one of those things, I, I was a kid at the time, and it seemed kind of terrifying to me. Was, um, was that at all the impetus for this? No. Uh, my idea came from uh, uh, a chemical spill in, or in uh, Utah. And uh, I read about it. There were some canisters that dropped off a truck. I see. Uh, and a couple of them broke open. And uh, they killed a bunch of sheep. They killed 200 to 300 sheep. But if the wind had been going the other way, there was Salt Lake City. And mm. that immediately started me to think about this idea. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's another virus, another pandemic. Now we're moving through time. We're moving geographically to another continent. Now we're off of North America. So Lauren Bukes, uh, your book, 
after land is set in the near future, although it's a pretty near future, which is kind of alarming. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, so tell, why don't you set up your reading and tell us um, and, 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 and go for it. I have a couple questions for you about this. Sure. So um, I just want to say that uh, to Emma's point earlier about like the word pandemic and epidemic, when we were doing the back cover blurb, um, I had the word pandemic in and my publishers were all, were all fighting with me. They were like, no, no one knows what that word means. It's too scientific. And now, yeah, it's the number one word we do know. So there has been a fairly unscientific plague, I'm sorry, it's not very credible, but uh, which kills 99% of the men and boys. It's a flu which has been going around the world for about 20 years, um, which I kind of based on HIV AIDS, which has apparently been around since the 50s and then just became a stealth killer. Um, it suddenly adapts and um, it becomes a very aggressive prostate cancer. Uh, kills 99% of the men and boys left in the world. And uh, Miles is one of the genetic survivors. He's not, this is not children of men. He's not the savior of men. He's not Jesus Christ. He's not Harry Potter. He's not the chosen one, even though he might like to think of it that way. Um, and his mom is trying to get him to a place of safety, busting them out of like this luxury, like facility where they've been kept and having experiments done on them. And she's just trying to get home to South Africa, which is the home of her heart and where her people are. So this is a scene just after her American husband has died and um, they've left his body behind. The plague notes have come to pick him up and uh, they're driving to the airport and they're gonna go home. And this is from Miles's perspective. He doesn't want to go home. All his friends are almost certainly dead. Not the girls obviously, but who knows? His best friends, Noah and Safiso and Isfahan and Henry and Gabriel and all the other boys in his class. Grandpa Frank is dead. Mom didn't even get to say goodbye to Grandpa except over Skype because they were stuck here. And Grandpa Frank was back in his house in Clarence by the river. His art teacher, Mr. Matthews, Uncle Eric, Jay, Ayanda, the funny crossing guard at the school, his favorite cashier at Checkers, the one who looks like Dwayne the Rock Johnson, dead, 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 all dead, the rock too. The doors switch open and they step into the departures hall. The shops and cafes are all locked up, although it's those see-through shutters so you can make out the empty shelves or mostly empty. There are lots of magazines, but no food apart from a ripped packet of chips spraying orange triangles across the floor. A notice at the cash register with the sad face emoji reads, Sorry, hand sanitizer sold out. The frozen baggage conveyor belts are curled up on themselves like dead millipedes. What does Safiso call them back home? Shongololos. Safiso is from Durban where they get so many you have to sweep them out of the house every day, but sometimes they're only playing dead to get you to leave them alone. Safiso was from Durban. The suitcase wheels go frrr over the floors. The only sound along with the squeak, squawk, squeak of their sneakers. No announcements, no Muzak. It's weird. Mom is on a mission, pushing ahead through the empty halls. And then to his relief, he recognizes the rising low buzz of noise as voices, human voices, as they follow the signs to Terminal D. Pull up your hoodie, okay? Mom warns. I don't want to attract attention. And um, Miles goes on to, do, well, he and his mom dis, did, um, um, disguise him, disguise him to, as a girl to, so he can go, because he, he becomes a valuable, as an uninfected male, one of the rare uninfected males, he becomes an incredibly valuable commodity. Absolutely. Um, and part of what I was trying to do there was kind of yeah. turn the teenage girl in peril, um, oh, narrative on his head. You know, so actually he's the one who's being um, objectified and sexualized and the government's trying to control his reproductive rights um, and kind of everyone's after him, including some very horrible human traffickers. Uh, interesting. Oh, so let, let's move on to some broader questions here about uh, virus. Why do, um, what's, the, what's the attraction? What's the allure of writing about 
a virus, which all of you have done. There had to be something about that particular element that, that drew you. Any thoughts on that? Well, everybody gets sick. And so people are interested in uh, sickness and in diseases. And I think that there's a certain fascination that I don't think is particularly morbid because mm. we're all human and we're all, uh, all flesh is grass. So the idea that uh, a disease can come along that kills lots of people. I mean, the people have been interested in that sort of thing because it actually happens since the days of the Black Death. Um, and uh, we see it again and again. We understand that we're vulnerable. And yet when someone comes along like uh, the coronavirus, uh, we're kind of caught flat footed by it. And uh, it takes a while to adjust. For me, it was just yeah. getting it was just getting to a world without men as quickly as possible. Hmm. It was never aliens, <laughs> um, but all magic. Um, but, but I had, but, uh, you know, having lived uh, in South Africa my entire life and seeing, you know, in particular what uh, HIV AIDS has like just destroyed so many communities, so many lives. We had a health minister who was in rabid denial about it and prescribing, you know, eating garlic and African potatoes instead of actually dealing with, kind of the real effects uh, and, and antiretrovirals, which is actually what saves lives. Um, th that was kind of a point of interest to me. But yeah, yeah it was also quite fun designing a virus and, and wow. talking to geneticists about like how this would work. And, and again, like, you know, I was really trying to play with kind of um, ideas about gender and the fact that uh, uh, the human papillomavirus, for example, is an SDI, which can turn into um, cervical cancer. So I wanted to kind of flip that uh, as well. Is that part of the, partly the, the virus has the, your, the virus in your book has the, the name, the three letter name, which, which, which when I read it the first time, I almost misread it as HPV. Yeah. I, I exactly. assume that's by design. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, Although I did learn something from a real world pandemic, which is, you know, my virus is called the human Kalgoa virus because it originates in Australia in a place called Kalgoa. But I've since learned through our experience in a real pandemic that we don't name viruses for places because it leads to all kinds of racism. Uh, right. Well, most people don't name viruses for places. Um, some people violate Science. that. Uh, that some well, people in this country violate that otherwise sensible rule, but we'll, we'll leave that. I might as well say it. Uh, Trump calls it the China virus. And uh, the idea that it belongs to some country or that something happened. I mean, people always look for a reason, don't they? They always want to find a culprit. And yeah. This thing happened as a result of, I think, Chinese wet markets. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that one of the, I, I mean, I do think that one of the things that's, that's, that's frightening about, well, I'm, I'm curious about what you think about what makes a virus frightening. I think one of the things that, that is, that is, is frightening, like the, at least in the, in, in Corona is that it seems to have hopped from a non-human species to a human species. And the human physiology doesn't know how to, uh, doesn't know how to contend with that. And yet, like we do name, we do name things because we look, we, we call Emma in 1918, we call it the Spanish flu. For, for purest propaganda, I mean, I always call it the great flu now because yeah. I realized that they just, the, the countries that were involved in World War I couldn't admit to anything as morale lowering as high rates of this new flu. So they, they just blamed Spain for it because in Spain, Spain wasn't in the war. So Spain was very honest about the fact that some of its politicians and its king happened to have it. So, you know, that bit of propaganda did stick. So I'm delighted that Trump's racist formulations didn't. But, you know, to answer your question, um, Daniel, about why write a virus story, I think a virus is like one of those blue light tests that, you know, shows you where in a room you touched. Um, mm. it, it literally traces our social relations mm. and even our relations with, say, animals. It, it traces all the things we've been doing since, since we started clustering in towns and cities and living cheek by jowl with each other. It, like, it's, it shows up that kind of invisible web of connections and it, it puts a price on them, you know, it makes them scary. They're, they're precious to us when we're not allowed to touch our grandparents um, and they're expensive to us, us if we feel, oh my God, I might've caught something in that Starbucks where there's an outbreak this week. So it, 
you know, if there wasn't a real virus, a novelist would have had to invent one because it's such an amazing way of taking the most everyday interactions and turning them into narrative gold. Uh huh. Well, it's interesting because it, 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 I mean, if you think about just the whole, you, you, like obviously any kind of narrative has to, has to have stakes. And so if you read a novel about a war, then, you know, obviously the stakes are high for a lot of people. You write a, no, you write a novel about a virus that could potentially affect everybody, then suddenly there's stakes to every interaction. And that is, I mean, at least to my mind, inherently dramatic, inherently terrifying in a way. Um, so let's, um, uh, what do you, do you let, let's go back to the, the one, one thing about the 1918 virus here. There's a, there's an idea out there that the, not that virus, which, which, uh, I don't remember the exact number, Emma, how many people it killed, but it's in the, in the millions. Is this, I mean, a significant effect on the well, world at that know. moment. Ask Emma, she'll know. You know, it's hard, it's hard to get historians to agree on this because, of course, they weren't doing very careful record keeping. You know, it's, it's a matter of what each city chose to record. I've seen estimates that it killed between four and six percent of the world. So obviously that's a very, very high death rate. In some parts of the world it was much worse than others. Countries in Asia and Africa had it the worst. So, you know, I set it in Ireland only because it's my home city, home place, not because that was where they had it worst. And of yeah. course, you know, another key thing to say about viruses is that even though we talk as if they're going to affect any human being as much as any other, they don't at all. Um, wealth is protective. So viruses are kind of an x-ray of social inequality. And um, we've seen that so much this year, haven't we? I mean, we've seen detailed city maps that show up where the poorer people live, where the racialized people live. Um, you know, a virus might at first seem equalizing, but it couldn't be, it couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, let me pick up on that. You you have a scene in your book where um, I, I think it's Julia. I think it's Julia is talking about her having to record cause of death. Tell That's us about right. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Julia's patients are from the inner city, and being Irish women in 1918, they're having way too many babies. So a lot of her women come in to give birth in the hospital already literally drained. You know, the calcium leached from their bones. And um, my mother had eight of us and she used to gently tease me by saying like, oh, you sucked the calcium from my bones. <laughs> Luckily, she had enough calcium. But, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about patients in this book who might come in with their 12th pregnancy, so weak and so underfed, so worn out. Um, one of them comes in with a, a one leg already swollen from the last birth. So of course, these women have no resources to stand up to something like the virus. So, um, you know, it's as if we all decide collectively who will be weakened by how we uh, apportion our financial resources. And then a virus comes along and we go, oh, well, no wonder they died. They had pre-existing conditions. So, you know, exactly the same kind of dynamic in 1918, or I'm sure during the Great Plague of London, you know, I think uh, gout is the only illness I know that the rich have tended to get more. And um, in almost every other case, having, having money, you know, can, can protect you from some of those, you know, social webs that can become fatal. I think Even your book, go oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, Daniel. Um, I think it was also interesting about your book, Emma, is how much it addresses um, women in a pandemic um, and what they're going through. And we're seeing the real life effects of that playing out right now where, um, and in previous plagues as well, like during Ebola, like the number of girls who just never went back to school, the number of women who just didn't return to the workforce, um, and you know, a lot of that that we're seeing today is because women are the homemakers and doing the emotional labor and doing like the schoolwork and the childcare, even in 2020. And women are just not returning to work at the same rates as men. Yeah, it's interesting. In those early weeks of um, of uh, COVID, there was a lot said about oh, men seem to be more physiologically vulnerable to it. You know, but then it soon became clear that yes an individual man might be more physiologically vulnerable than an individual woman. But if the women are looking after the old people in the care homes, if the women are, you know, um, with the kids, um, if the women are doing so much health care, you know, that's going to offset it. So I think, in fact, that means that a lot, quite a lot of, of, of um, the people who, who get and suffer from COVID have been women because of their, the kind of risks of their lives. So yeah, as you say, Lauren, it's extremely gendered and a lot of women have been kind of as it were, knocked off the social ladder, you know, whether being at school yeah. or being in the workplace. 
I'm just, yeah. I've been so grateful that my kids have been teenagers because I know it would be entirely different if they were younger. You know? Yeah, and, and you know, related to that is power. I mean, Stephen King, I, I feel like The Stand is, is, is in, in some ways a book about power as well as about, about virus. Any, any thoughts on that about what viruses tell us about power or what, even what you were trying to say about power in your book? Well, I don't, I think that one of the things that I was trying to say was that uh, in any kind of a crisis situation, uh, a man on horseback always rise, rises to the top. Somebody will come forward and say, I can deal with this, assuming that they're, uh, they're immune to begin with. Now, the uh, super flu that I wrote about wipes out uh, something like 99.6% of the population, which only leaves uh, uh, just a few people, a few fortunate people. And uh, one of the things that interested me about the flu when I researched it many moons ago was that uh, it's a shifting antigen uh, virus, all right? So that the flu shot you got last year uh, isn't necessarily mm -hmm. going to anything about the flu that you might have going around this year. And in fact, uh, I got the, uh, the old person's flu shot this year, which is uh, double strength or it covers who knows what. Uh, all I know is I roll up my sleeve and I, I take the shot. But uh, the pharmacist is very clear saying, this may predict, protect you and it may not protect you. And uh, one of the things that I think we have to think about when it comes to coronavirus that we have now, uh, and you talk about people in power, uh, we obviously have a lot of people in power who don't belong in power. Um, Lauren talked about, uh, what did you say? It was eating garlic. And uh, the president of the United States talked about drinking bleach. Uh, as a possible uh, cure for coronavirus. So uh, it's a little bit like, uh, does anybody really understand the depth of this thing? Well, mm. the people who do, uh, Dr. Fauci seems to understand uh, how serious it is, but uh, he's kind of like kryptonite to uh, the people who are in power right now, the people who are controlling this thing. Uh, please God, not much longer. But uh, the thing about the coronavirus is viruses mutate and it may be uh, what everybody sort of hopes for is that not only will there be a vaccine, but the corona will mutate into something that causes the sniffles. This is a very, very serious disease. Um, uh, President Trump can liken it to the flu, but it's not like the flu. This is uh, dangerous. It's a killer uh, and it has long lasting effects and it is extremely catching, which is why um, the people who are working in the hospitals and the ambulances and uh, the first responders are taking tremendous risks. Even the people who work in the supermarkets are taking tremendous risks. You can have those plexi shields between you and the next person but the change gets handed back and forth. The credit cards sometimes get handed back and forth if it's not a chip machine. And what happens if the corona doesn't mutate into something that is uh, uh, not so harmful, but into something that's more harmful, something that's more like the super flu. And you can say, oh, well, Steve King writes those horror books. But somebody has to think about these things and be prepared for these things. And that's where we're not now. Uh, I think that um, the people in the CDC would tell you that for years, they have understood that sooner or later, this would happen. MERS, SARS, HIV, mm -hmm. sooner or later, it was gonna be something that you could catch where you couldn't blame this class of people or that class of people. Uh, one of the problems that uh, President Trump has had with COVID-19 is that he can't politicize it. Uh, even he got it. So here you are. I didn't talk too much about power, 
because in this case, the disease is the thing with the power. Interesting. What? How do you? How do you explain that? As a, I mean, I, th think this through as 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 a novelist. What's going through the head of someone like the health minister in South Africa or <laughs> our own American president in this res in this resistance to science? Is it? Do you think it's an attempt to to deceive? Do you think it is? A de a denial? Do you think it is stupidity? I mean, get in. Th just think about those real individuals as characters and get inside their head and explain to me their motivations and what the hell is going on. So I just have to make a correction, which is yeah. that it was our old health minister from the early 2000s. Right. Um, so our current health minister has actually been terrific, advised everyone to mask up early, has been really good. And Ashley just came down with him and his wife just came down with COVID, he announced this morning. And he's been oh, wow. very careful, but he's he's really been great. And our presidency has been great, apart from the prohibition. Um, so I've actually been really impressed with it. So dissing our old health minister. Sure, sure, friend. sure. And that was, and, and, and his, I mean, again, looking at it from far, far away, I think that part of his uh, dismissal of it was because HIV AIDS was so highly sexualized. I think that was part of it. Was, it, was actually, it was actually a woman, uh, Manto, and she, um, part of the Mbeki government and uh, he was the president at the time, there was a lot of resistance and there was a lot of um, American propaganda about how HIV AIDS was caused by, uh, it was, you know, uh, a conspiracy theory that the World Health Organization had unleashed HIV AIDS upon Africa. So we fell hook, line and sinker for that. And I am oversimplifying this and I'm sure there's South Africans watching you're gonna scream blue murder. Please correct me in the comments. Well, but, um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see if we get any questions, Lauren, here on yeah, that. Absolutely. But I don't see I don't see any angry South Africans <laughs> yet. Okay, good. They're all asleep. Um, but yeah, so so but that level of denial um, was just absolutely hor horrific and and we killed hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And they were poor and black. Um, and, you know, and then some gay men, but it really just devastated this country and people were dying everywhere. And we got through it, but at a terrible, terrible cost because of this blinkedness. And the president at the time, Thabo Mbeki said, actually, well, you know, HIV AIDS is a disease of poverty and he's not wrong for exactly the same reasons Emma was talking about in that you are more likely to develop full-blown AIDS and die horribly because you don't have money, because you can't get like healthy food to eat, because you can't actually look after yourself. But you can't just rely on healthy food. You also need the medicine. There was, sorry, I want to riff on one, more, one last thing, which sure, is something I really found out, um, which is that apparently, and again, scientists, please correct me. My understanding is that if, you, if your ancestors had bubonic plague, it uses the same viral receptors as HIV AIDS. So if your ancestors had bubonic plague and survived, you are less likely to contract HIV AIDS. Really? Apparently so. That's what my research turned up. So um, fascinating. So so let's go let's go back to let me, let me pick up on the research point here. Were there were there um, uh, works of fiction, especially that were um, meaningful, useful to you as you wrote your own novel about um, an, an epidemic, a virus? For me, it was more, um, I, I drew on memoir and diaries, like Kathleen Lynn is the one real character in my book. And I looked at her diaries of keeping a, a fluke clinic up and she, she tried all these vaccines. And of course, she didn't know what a virus was. Nobody did in 1918. So there she was attempting these vaccines based on a bacterial understanding. You know, it's so gallant. Um, sometimes just very brief memoirs. And um, there was this in, in, a, a, in a book um, about the flu in America, there was a, a volunteer who worked for six days at a hospital and then caught the flu and died. And apparently mm. on her deathbed, she said, this has been the best week of my life. You know, so it was that kind of fleeting mm. little bit of, of um, the historical record that I found most inspiring. Um, the, the kind of sheer, you know, gallantry and zest and dark humor. And then I would supplement that with things like, you know, modern books about, about medicine and um, by, you know, doctors um, 
uh, and, and midwives, you know, anything to sort of capture the vibe, vibe of people desperately trying to keep up that web of healthcare in, in terrible situations. Did any, did, did Steve or, or Lauren, did you look to books like, like novels like, like, uh, like The Plague or uh, Magic Mountain or um, uh, the Boccaccio uh, book about Florence or anything like that as, as inspiration, as, as sort of to help understand a way to tell your story? Well, I remember reading a book uh, when I was very young, probably in junior high school, uh, by George Stewart called Earth Abides. And in that story, um, uh, the main character, the protagonist, uh, was bitten by a rattlesnake and almost died. And whatever was in the bite made him uh, immune to a disease that just covered mankind. And I think it helped that he was stuck in the desert recovering from this bite at the same time. And I was fascinated um, by a world I hope you never see. I was fascinated by uh, uh, what the world would look like if the plague of mankind and womankind actually uh, disappeared from the planet and what would happen and uh, huh. how they would recover. One of the characters near the end of this, the stand says, uh, what is the best we can hope for? And the other character says, a season of rest. And right now the tired old earth would really love to have a season of rest. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't think anybody wants that to happen uh, at the cost of uh, millions of lives. And we have to remember, and Emma knows this very, very well, that the coronavirus today is nothing. It's not a patch on the, the, the flu pandemic of 1918. Uh, that was much worse and it killed a lot more people. Although Emma mentions in there one thing that, that uh, I absolutely love because I've seen the pictures uh, on the net since then. Uh, women standing shoulder to shoulder wearing masks saying, uh, wear a mask or go to jail. And uh, that's what we need right now. Wear a mask or go to jail. Well, there are, I mean, there, 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 I mean, masks, as, as you mentioned, Steve, masks make an appearance in, 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 um, in Emma's books and in some lovely uh, descriptions uh, of them. Uh, that reminds me, I was thinking about it even, even today when I, when I was out and we, there are people here on the mean streets of Washington, D.C. wearing those masks that sort of like, almost like are, are duck-like. Um, and I think you have some, th forgive me, Emma, but there's something in your novel about those kinds of, ma about bird-like masks. People wore them very inconsistently in, yeah. in the British Isles. Uh, they were a bigger deal in America. And um, in Britain, I think it was sporadic and people didn't quite know how to wear them anywhere in the world. There was this period that you should wear the mask while you were out walking along the street. And then when you got to the, the pub or the cinema or your home, you take it off, you know, as if it was an overcoat. So I'm not sure how effective they were then, but but you know it was worth a try. And yes, even back then you can see that tension between the kind of you know crazed libertarian you know anti-mask leagues and then people saying you know it it seems at least you know hopeful. Let's let's try it. You know. And you that, see that, some you see some earnest public messaging. And forgive me again on this. Um, keeping three books in my head is not my forte. But there's a there's a slogan that's in your. Um, that people use about um, stir, with the word stir in it. Maybe it's, if in doubt, don't stir out. Yeah. If it, oh, yeah I made up all those bits of government propaganda, but they were oh, all really? inspired by real posters. In America, they had quite a few rhyming posters, for instance, like coughs and sneezes spread diseases. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, oh, they, I, I think that. these governments were all a little bit paternalistic. They were like, oh, if we make it rhyming, the poor ignorant plebs may be able to remember this slogan, you know? And um, well, those, it, it, those government it, 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 signs were so falsely on, reassuring. On turnpike uh, boards, you know, the LED boards, coughs and sneezes spread diseases. It's everything old is new again. Uh, it's it's like that. It's like that poem. Uh, I, I had a little bird. Its name was Enza. I opened the window. And influenza. Um, so we have. Um, 
on the, for the, all the folks watching, we have some questions piling up. For, for people watching, go to the Q&A function on Zoom. And I'm gonna to turn to the Q&A from the, from the audience here, you guys, if that's all right. Um, mm -hmm. And what we have is that people are able to submit questions and then vote on which ones that they, they like. So we have the wisdom of crowds, or at least the preference of crowds here. And number one at the top is from Karen Anderson. I don't know where Karen's from. It's not a question, but I'm gonna say, it says, I'm gonna read it directly. Please tell Mr. King, thank you for standing up to President Trump. So Mr. King, thank you for standing up to President Trump. Oh, Karen's from Washington, DC, my, she's probably my neighbor. Um, so that's one. Um, another interesting question. Oh, here we go. Now we're now everybody's chiming in here. Uh, from Mike A says, uh, after living through the last six to eight months, is there anything any of the writers would change about the book they wrote? I definitely would. Um, I hadn't considered how you know, my heroine is isolated and that's probably why I made her as South African is that she doesn't have friends and family to turn to. And that's why she's so desperate to get out of America. But I hadn't realized just how dehumanizing and lonely it would be not to be able to see your friends, mm. to hug your family. I don't know when I'm going to be able to fly up to Joburg to see my mom again. And that has been really devastating. So that's definitely something I would, um, would change. What about Steve or Emma? Well, I think probably uh, one of the things that's missing from the stand, except when they're disposing of bodies, are masks, because I think the masks would be a first step and that uh, if I had that book to do over again, I would have a lot of people wearing masks. And what Lauren just said, the isolation, the, mm -hmm. the way that people uh, are faced with living and sometimes dying alone. Yeah. Um, Emma? I, I wouldn't change anything, not because it's perfect, because, but just because it's 1918. I, I think I, I tried to make it as true to 1918 as I could, and our circumstances are so different now. We have these tantalizing pleasures like, you know, Zooming with authors you idolize, you know, so near and yet so far, you know, so I will look back and say, did I meet Stephen King or no, maybe that was a Zoom thing in the, in the year in the year 2020, you know? So yeah, back then, I guess they, they probably read more books and uh, had less Netflix, yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, I think one of the things that's interesting, and I wanna encourage the folks watching this to, to read all these books, but there's something kind of powerful reading them together when it comes to loneliness, because if you look at, um, at, at the stand, it is a, um, the, 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 the setting is vast. I mean, it's essentially the whole country and you have, um, uh, Las Vegas and Boulder and, you know, this whole, basically the whole American country and then the whole American uh, landscape. And then Lauren's book is, is a, is a, is a race to get out and people are covering, you know, the, the two main characters are covering a lot of territory. Meanwhile, Emma's is, um, kind of like room, I guess, big insight there. It's that it's very, um, confined. Um, the, the, the Wonderful play, wouldn't it make a great play? It, 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 ha it's a great point. Actually. I hadn't thought about that. It's a, it's a fascinating, I mean, for those of you who haven't read it, it's cause it takes place over a small amount of time in a, in a, in a single place. Yeah. Also, I mean, again, I don't, I'm going to get to the audience question here, Emma, but what, what, what is with not using quotation marks? You know, I usually use quotation marks, but for this one, I wanted to try the the style of no quotes dialogue that um, some writers I love, like Roddy Doyle, Cormac McCarthy, Ali mm. Smith do it. And what it does is it makes the reader work just slightly harder yeah. to, to see a distinction between spoken words and thoughts. And I wanted the whole book, you know, this, this nurse midwife is having such a grueling three days. I wanted the whole thing to have that slightly trippy feel of like, Words float by, and you're not quite sure of the distinction between the spoken ones and the thought ones. Yeah, it, it connects to C's point about 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 a play. You you feel like you're in this, you're you're sort of in the room um, with all of these characters. So fascinating. Okay, so let's go to uh, we go we're going to more audience questions here. Uh, we've got Ellen. Ellen uh, has wants to know. Okay, uh, this is for all of you. Are there sort of I sort of asked this a little bit, but are there historic pandemic fiction books you recommend or were inspired by? 
I can't, oh God, I can't remember the author's name. It's about cholera and the, and the first outbreak of cholera um, in the UK and tracing it back and how they developed germ theory. Um, I'm going to have to Google it. I'm going to Google it while you guys are answering your questions. This is one of the great things about being on Dude, Zoom is I that know. you can, you can, the world doesn't know that you're Googling. <laughs> um, any any recommendations from uh, from King or Donahue? Um, Station Eleven by oh. Emily St. John oh, Mandela. Yes. That's a very good one. It's very subtle because it's not like the internet is just snuffed out. It's more like, you know, people go and queue up near, near towers to get just a little bit of Wi-Fi. So the idea that our civilization, that there would be just kind of dregs of it left that we'd be competing for, you know, the kind of wistfulness. I found that incredibly realistic you know it's not it's not all or nothing it's that we probably will have the remnants right? um, i found it, it it's the ghost map by stephen johnson oh and terrific right I yeah that's a non-fiction non yeah. book by steve yeah that's a, a, a yeah uh fascinating about um yeah great book i love it there's the hot zone by uh, richard okay richard preston <laughs> And the one that I think uh, that you, it's, it's hard for me to tell <clears throat> uh, whether or not people want to read about um, mass outbreaks of disease in a time like this or whether they don't. But the one that stands out in my mind is called The End of October uh, by Lawrence Wright. And the amazing thing about this book is that he wrote it before. Right the virus and he hit every note just about from beginning to end uh, including the uh, inability apparently the, the political inability of people to look this in the face and say we're going to take uh, the necessary steps but you the, the thing about that book that will haunt me uh, there are lines that you remember in fiction you know um, uh, in 1984, all the clocks were striking 13, <clears throat> things like that, that, that we remember. And the last line, and I'm not going to spoil the book, but the last line of the Lawrence Wright book, the end of October is, we did this to ourselves. Mm. Right, right. It's, it's, uh, it, where yeah. the disease comes from, it's a question of what you do about it once it's there. Yeah, yeah. I think what's interesting about that book, again, the timing of it, it's sort of like Emma's book. It's like, it's like extraordinary that that book came out. I think, what did that come out, Steve? Like, like February, sub this year or something like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, he takes a, because he's a journalist and a documentary filmmaker. And so that, that's a, a very kind of very journalistic account. I'm interested that, that you're, that you're, that you all are not going back further, um, further, further in time. Um, but well, live in the time of cholera. Um, although I think that's more about kind of normal life, well, like Emma's book, I suppose, like the pandemic is kind of a backdrop to yeah. the real election. Um, and more recently, I really like Chuck Wendig's Wanderers, um, which yeah. felt, yeah, yeah. And, he, and he's just a terrific writer and really great. And it was just super fun uh, and also very chilling with kind of all these right wing militias kind of forming. I can't speak with the rest of you, but I'm always a bit nervous of reading books that are too similar to the one I'm hmm. working on. I might read Very them before I begin, but once I'm in it, the last thing I yeah. want is to yeah. suddenly be too influenced by Camus' The Plague, for instance, yeah. where nonfiction feels like is a, is a nourishing source for fiction, but other people's fiction dangerous you might find it so good you don't need to write your book for instance Inter yeah. Yeah, fascinating f fascinating fascinating point I i'll throw one into the mix even though it's not purely about a virus and a pandemic is uh, i thought it was one of the better novels i've read in the last several years uh, present company excluded of course is um uh the great believers by um uh rebecca uh, mckay about um uh the very early days of the aids epidemic and it's not so much about the it's not so much about the the virus itself, or the illness itself. It's about how it cascades into people's social worlds. Mm -hmm. um, um, but enough about me. Let's let's talk about um, other questions from people. Let's go to we have Heather. Heather wants to know what is happening now. Whoop. 
Hold on a second. It, it flipped on me here. Okay, here we go. What is happening now that you could not... Well, I'm going to skip that one because I think we uh, answer that one. Um, okay, here we go. Sorry about that, Heather. Uh, we're gonna, we got another Karen here. Uh, will anybody... Will any of you be writing about this pandemic in any form or fashion? I think everybody's going to be writing about this pandemic because this is like a massive moment in history um, for us. And, I, you know, um, so I, I think there's no way to avoid it. Like every novel going forward. I mean, how do you write a novel set a year from now or two years from now without imagining, OK, well, will people all be wearing masks? How many more people will have died? What will be happening? Uh, it's impossible not to imagine reality where, or, or fiction where our current reality doesn't play a major part. Yeah. Yeah, when I was, I, I talked to, uh, at the beginning about a, a book that I was working on when the thing uh, broke out. And uh, there were minor characters in there that I had to move off the scene at some point. And so I sent them clues. And the book was set in uh, 2020. And I thought, well, that, can't happen, that's ridiculous, it cannot happen. So my solution was to move everything back to 2019, but it's what Lauren just said. That's a quick fix, uh, the same way that uh, the TV shows that you see now, uh, nobody's wearing masks, everybody's kissy kissy, huggy huggy. <laughs> that's gonna have to change and it's a huge challenge for the novelist. Um, Emmett, any thoughts on that? I can't say yet because I've got something set this year, but you know, okay. it turned out to be embarrassingly bad. So let's just not speak of it till it's we, we also have a question. So, but while I'm on you, we have a question uh, somewhere in this queue, which which is filling up rapidly here and, and really taxing my abilities to multitask. Is um, uh, what's your musical about? Again, I can't say because. Oh, you want to say? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Might not happen. The um, yeah, it's interesting though the way that you the way you're responding to that that, that question in in a way you're you're saying we, that the novelists will have to reckon with this as the backdrop of our lives, um, or uh, else you, you could deliberately write a novel that doesn't refer to it. You could you could have your say a couple in the countryside and just not refer to the outside world, which is much how Boccaccio does it, I believe. His Decameron is very much like let's tell stories and not talk about the plague. So yeah, whether we pointedly leave it out or we set yeah. everything in 2019 or whether we set everything 10 years on and hope that there's no masks anymore, either way, you know, there'll be a, there'll be a fault line in fiction. Yeah, this is, this is hard to foresee, but do you see sort of, you know, um, um, uh, like, like uh, COVID novels? That is, in the, in the same way we, 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 we think about, oh, that's a, that's a Vietnam, you know, the things they carry, that's a Vietnam War novel or... Um, you know, World War II novels, or do you, you think that we'll see a whole collection of, of plague novels that are ex like, or COVID novels that are explicitly about COVID-19? Yeah, I think they'll all come out in about another, you know, nine months. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> and even novels set in a part of the world that maybe you didn't touch as much as any other, you'll still, you'll still see the ripples. Yeah, it'll be very interesting to see how writers cope with this because we don't all write to want we don't all want to write the same thing, you know. Right. We don't all want to be you know complaining about how glitchy Zoom was, you know. <laughs> we want our own territory, and this is an experience that everyone is having to a certain extent. So we have this kind of dread of not being original. I'm I'm waiting for a sort of Edward Albee style. What's the matter with Virginia Woolf play? But it's about two families that have formed a family pod together. Free idea for anybody out there. Let's keep moving on. A question from Mr. King from Jennifer. Jennifer says, I have taught the stand in many college level English classes and my students have often asked why the center of all the goodness, <laughs> why this, this is a great question. Why the center of all the goodness in the novel, which is Mother Abigail, um, who's a, a uh, centenarian, uh, why, why all the goodness in the novel, Mother Abigail is from Nebraska. As a native Nebraskan myself, I must admit that I too am curious. So why Nebraska? Because I love it. I love Nebraska. I love the, the middle of the country. Uh, 
it's it's big and it feels like home to me because I'm a country kid. I grew up in the country, and uh, you know, some writer and it might have been uh, Cormac McCarthy said. He said, the thing about the Midwest is reality is thinner there. Hmm. And, uh, so it seemed like a good place. And as far as the people settling in Boulder, I was living there when I wrote the book. So. All right. So that's uh, so you can answer that question for your for your students. Amanda wants to know, uh, are there lessons that you hope <laughs> Sorry, every time I start reading a question, it moves on me. Are there are there lessons that you hope people will take away from your novels in coping with the COVID-19 pandemic? And then she says, how can fiction, this is a great question, how can fiction help us process this moment? So in my novel, there is an anarchist community who are, and you know, I have to emphasize that the novel is really post-pandemic, it's three years later. Um, but there's an anarchist community that is trying to kind of overthrow capitalism and um, provide housing for all and get rid of national debt. And I think there have been sparks of hope through the pandemic that we're living through right now. And in Cape Town and Johannesburg in particular, we've seen a lot of community action networks, uh, specifically pairing up between the very wealthy suburbs and the desperately poor suburbs but meeting as equals as opposed to kind of charity handouts and working with community leaders to figure out what to do. And a lot of that is woman led. Um, and that's been really, really interesting to see. And I hope that we can take some really good lessons about from this, you know, as Emma was talking about earlier, so much of this comes down to inequality and poverty. Um, and it'd be really great if we can come out of this with universal basic income and free healthcare for all and, you know, some really good lessons as well. Well said. And the nurse in my novel uh, has a, a, a watch and she makes a little scratch on it every time she loses a patient. She can't bear the idea that these, you know, nobodies from the slums and stillborn babies who will be never spoken of again, you know, that nobody will record that they died. So she makes a little scratch. And I think a lot of people this year have been devastated at not having the traditional ways like funerals to, to grieve mm -hmm. their dead. I mean, I'm so glad that I lost my mother in 2018, big Irish funeral, all her walking club there, all my family around me, you know, that, that was a, that was a, a better way to, um, to mark somebody's death. You know, these, these um, long distance or Zoom style funerals is brutal. So I suppose my novel in a way is about taking those moments to, to respect and to mourn all the ones we're losing, you know. Uh, another question. This was. This is from. This is from. It's from Gwydion. Uh, he he says that living through a pandemic seems to have. This is a little bit American focus, so forgive us for that. Uh, living through a pandemic seems to have brought a deep American conflict into focus. Some of us want to be free to make our own individual decisions about, say, mask wearing and social distancing, but the virus reminds us of the fact that we are, like it or not, a collective of human beings. Um, we are one, and we will only beat the virus if we fight it this way. Uh, we're also one planet um, and, uh, you know, it's related. So his question is, with that dilemma in the background, this dilemma about sort of the sort of fundamental American conflicts or so, let's say fundamental human conflicts being surfaced here, uh, how can literature help us find common ground and restore that sense of collective belonging? Can books bring us together at this critical moment? Probably not. Probably not. I think everybody uh, has a tendency to read things that uh, sort of reinforce where they're coming from. Um, and you know, the thing about the masks and politicizing the masks, you can correct me if I've got the wrong attribution. I thought it was Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, who said uh, freedom ex of speech doesn't extend to yelling fire in a crowded theater. And it seems to me that uh, the whole idea of uh, uh, personal choice and freedom uh, here in this country or in England or in South Africa or wherever, it doesn't include the uh, ability to uh, not wear a mask because it's not just you, it's the question of are you infecting others? 
it's a paradox, isn't it? Because the novel as a form, you could say, has um, individualism built, in, you know, baked into it in that it's all about, you know, the one interesting person, or even if you've got a hundred characters, it's those particular hundred, it's not people in general. But yet a novel is also a really good technology of empathy. I have ended up yeah. caring deeply about people who I wouldn't have before because I wouldn't get close enough to them in real life. So potentially a novel does make you see those, those webs of human connection and think about the effect of your behavior on others. And, you know, as we've been saying, a, a, an illness like this makes a mockery of the idea of the individual rights you know, where we're all living in this biosphere together and literally breathing in each other's faces. So, you know, the idea that I have some personal right to choose whether to wear a mask or not is just so scientifically naive. Daniel, uh, I think that uh, Lauren would like to answer Audrey's question. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Thanks, Steve. Uh, let me try. Let me see if I can find Audrey's question here. Mm. So Audrey was asking why- Go for it, go for it, go for, go for it. Just read Audrey's question and answer it. Absolutely. So why did you, wait, I can't read it properly. Um, it's about why I decided to kill trans women as if they were cis men and how painful that was. Um, so obviously this is, well, maybe not obviously, but trans rights are very important to me and my feminism aims to be intersectional. Um, I had a blind spot in the book and I didn't actually realize that it would be so hurtful. I had some trans activists and trans people reach out to me. Um, some people were very angry and very in pain um, after the book was published. And I went back to try and understand where uh, my blind spots were. And I specifically, I hired two sensitivity readers, a trans man and a trans woman um, to go back through the manuscript and show me you know, to help me understand. And I also spoke to an amazing trans doctor in Cape Town who is herself a trans woman and deals with a lot of gender affirmation surgeries. So I've certainly learned a lot from that. Uh, women do have prostates, women can die from prostate cancer. And also if you're a trans woman, I learned, um, and you are on hormone replacement therapy, you have a much, much lower risk of dying of prostate cancer. So that's been a lot of stuff that I've learned along the way. And I'm very sorry for any pain that I've caused the trans community. Okay, thanks for that question. Let's, thanks for that question, Audrey. Uh, let's go to, so we have a question from Patty uh, for Emma. Um, well, we've, we've, we've covered this a little bit. She wants to know, I was struck by the signs from the government with slogans and directions about what to do to prevent illness. Uh, was that language taken from real signs that were posted at the time? Um, I guess you, you, you did you harvest it's those not, at all? It's not a direct quotation, but yeah. in all my reading, I remember jotting down stuff about what, what government posters said in Brazil, in Argentina, in, in many countries in the world, and those famous American posters too. And what I was trying to capture wasn't the, the details of local policy, but the kind of weird tonal shifts, the way governments would try and, you know, scare you into doing sensible things like staying home. And then the next minute they'd be saying, but we have the situation well in hand, you know, because I realized this year politicians always have mixed motives, even if they're good people, they're, they're trying to help the economy and they're trying to, you know, make sure people will vote for them. They're trying, you know, to, to quell panic. They've all sorts of motivations which are not the same as those of the scientists. And basically, I've come out of this year trusting the scientists a lot more. Um, but yes, in those posters, I really tried to find the kind of dark humor in the fact that governments can rarely afford to simply tell you the truth. You know, they're always somehow massaging the facts and spinning the situation. Interesting. Um, Interesting question here from uh, from Nandini, um, who who I happen to know, and she's a, just full disclosure, she's a public health professional, uh, and she says, uh, as fiction, she's from here in Washington D.C. As fiction writers, how would you craft the end of the COVID nineteen story? And she says, maybe literature can give public health some ideas. Oh, I have an well, idea. I, yeah, I would have it as a youth sure. movement. Yeah, I nice. would have, you know, basically the kids on TikTok would just make it so universally cool to to uh, wear masks all the time. You know, it would soon become just more and more fuddy duddy and pathetic and socially it would make you a pariah if you if you weren't following the rules. So yeah, it would be wonderful to have it as a as a sort of upswelling of youth culture. TikTok TikTok army takes over and resolves the issue. Lauren or Steve, any thoughts on, on how you would end this story or, or at I, least- I, Well, 
I want a lot of high fashion masks, so it becomes like kind of standard and just like really beautiful. Although I, you know, I also have friends who are hard of hearing, um, who really struggle because suddenly they can't read lips as well. Um, so I think we also have to be careful of not being too ableist, I guess, as well. Uh, and I don't know how to figure that out, but you know, ideally, uh, you guys get Americans get a new president. Uh, the new president sorts everything out. We actually listen to our <laughs> scientists and take the time to develop a vaccine. And in the meantime, we actually mask up and we social distance and we're responsible and we don't go partying and yeah. But that seems to be asking a lot. Well, Stephen King, how would you, what, what, what's, what's your, what's your, how would you write this next chapter? Well, the thing is, I, I would have to think about it some more because what Lauren said is true. And of course, uh, masks have already started to become fashion accessories. Uh, we own corgis here, and so I have corgi face masks, uh, including one that has two rolls of toilet paper between the corgis. It just sort of covers everything. <laughs> but what Lauren is saying doesn't have that novelistic bang at the end of it that you want to look for. I mean, need more murder hornets. That's it. <laughs> yeah. We need we need more murder hornets. Uh, I, I, man, I don't know that the best ending th that I can think of uh, offhand that even comes close to what we're talking about and not very close is the end of the War of the Worlds when the Martians are all killed by microbes because they're not used to Earth microbes. So they all just sort of uh, dribble out of their uh, death machines. But it would have to be something like that. But what we're looking at probably is just a gradual winding down. Yeah. Uh, it might get quite a bit better. Uh, but the thing about the climax is that this is have to be with us for quite a while. I mean, they're going to be a vaccine, which a lot of people won't take because of the conspiracy theories uh, about how it's going to make you grow a third eye. You know, you'll, you'll be injecting uh, a deep state space box into your bloodstream and they will be watching you. So I, I'm not sure right now, I just see a gradual winding down and that's just not a novel. No, no. So I saw a great thing, I think it was on Twitter um, where some wonderful wits had talked about what if, you know, everything which keeps going wrong with 2020 is actually time travelers who are desperately trying to fix things but every time they try, they make it worse. Um, and I quite like that novelist. That's idea, good. But succeed in the end. That's good. I, I kind of like the Tic Tac army coming to the to coming to the rescue. That's you know um, at least that's that's it's very it's it's cinematic if nothing else. Uh, other questions. We're gonna try to we're gonna try to cram in a few more here, guys. Before we before we wrap up here, this is from Cindy. Uh, she says uh, it's for Stephen King, but but all can answer. Uh, what is your what is your favorite character that you brought into existence? Or is there a particular character that you've created that you, that, that you like talking about and you, you're, you're glad you brought into the world? Well, since we're talking about uh, plagues, I like Mother Abigail from the yeah. state. It what, do you like, what do you like about her? She's sort of, she's almost like a godlike figure. Yeah, she's old and she's wise, but at the same time, she's down to earth and, uh, uh, she says something like, uh, she's getting ready to get all these people come to her house and she, uh, strings up a pig and she says, uh, dear God, thank you for this meat and please don't let me screw this up. So it's like the divine and the profane at the same time. Oh, I just, nice. Yeah. And she was from Nebraska. So of course I liked her. <laughs> Emma or Lauren, any favorite characters that you brought to life? I think my favorite character is Zinzi December from uh, my novel Zoo City, which won the Arthur C. Clarke Award. Um, it's probably my weirdest book and very difficult to explain. Uh, hmm. it's, it's about a woman with a sloth on her back who has the magical ability to find lost things. And she also writes email scans and is tasked with finding a missing pop star. Um, but she's, she's trying really hard. She's dealing with a lot of kind of grief and trauma. And one of the things I was trying to do with that book was looking at how we get over not only the things which have been done to us, whether that's personal or systemic, 
but also how we how we recuperate and recover and be better um, from the things that we've done. Also, she has a sloth. Uh, that that you had me at sloth on their back. I know, right? <laughs> Emma? I always find the question hard to answer because I yeah. feel I'm going to hurt the feelings of all my other children, you know? That's what I would think, yeah. Yeah, so, and I guess in the most recent book, I like Bridie because she's, she's an oh, absolute yeah. nobody. She's a volunteer. I like her. You know, the nun sender and volunteer in this ward. And she's the only character I've ever written based on a, a, on a state inquiry. The Irish state did an inquiry into its terrible residential institutions. Um, and you know all, all the appalling things that were done to, to kids there so i decided that bridie would be like like the one somehow untouched thing that came through that awful system that she would have just these natural reserves of kind of curiosity and energy and human warmth despite never having been treated well by anybody so she was she was me asking a question of whether you know you just might be able to triumph over a terrible upbringing so i really enjoyed writing her from those very dry and dark sources. Okay, we've got a few more. We got lots of questions coming in here. The, uh, this one uh, from um, uh, Miranda. Uh, what is your favorite thing about the writing process and what was it like writing and publishing your first novel? So we have th four, three very accomplished novelists. Go back in time. What was it like doing the very first one? I tried to have mine recalled. The publishers bought my first two together, Penguin did. And I called them up after about six months and I said, can we scrap the first one, Stir Fry, to start with the second, it's a much better book. And my editor said, yes, it's a much better book, but most people will prefer your first one. It's just more kind of cheerful and likable. So she said, trust me on this, let me go ahead. And she was dead right. The first one sold better than the second, even though the second was better. So, you know, at a certain point you have to just let them go out into the world. Um, I, I think I just came easier to me. I was more hungry. I hadn't got all the pressure of, oh, interesting. You know, of having awards and having to live up to the previous book. Um, so I struggled with that a bit. I'm also, I'm the opposite of an introvert writer. I actually need other people around me. So normally I work from a studio and it's been very devastating to have to sit at home and write alone. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was more fun. It came more easily. It felt like play. It felt really experimental. Um, and of course there was the fear of failure and the fear of success, but I feel like it just loads on the more, the more books you write. Maybe Stephen can tell us how to get over that. No, I mean, well, he's, uh, yeah, Steve. So if you can go back in time, your very first book, what, tell us what that was like. And then maybe answer Lauren's question about how do you get over any of the hurdles, inevitable hurdles that come for the subsequent ones? Well, it depends on you whether or not you mean my first published book or my first book, uh, because I was, I guess that I finished a novel by the time that I was 18. It was later published under a, a, a pseudonym, uh, Richard Bachman. It was, called, oh. it was called at that time, Getting It On, and it was later published as Rage. And uh, it was a school shooter novel that I pulled off. The, I won't let it, be sold anymore. I guess there's black market in copies uh, uh, on eBay and places like that. But with Carrie, uh, there was no second novel jitters. I, I had written about half of it and I threw it away. And uh, my wife says, what's this in the wastebasket? And she picked it out and, and uh, she read it with this uh, a very Tabitha smile on her face. And uh, I said, I this was going to be a short story and it's all about young women and I don't really know what to do. And she said, I will help you. And she did. And uh, the book got done and it was sitting in a little pile of manuscript, single space, because in those days I had to save all the paper that I could. So I had it on the side of the desk and I was writing another book at the time that Carrie sold uh, that was called Salem's Lot. So oh, yeah. For any of the second novel jitters because I had something on the go. It was fun. It's always been fun. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think one of the things that's sort of, I think we have a lot of aspiring writers on here. I think one of the things that I'm taking away from, from, from you folks is just, you know, the lesson of uh, sit down and do the work. And how do you feel about that? Sitting yeah. down and doing the work? 
Yeah. I resist it every day, but I show up. I mean, I, I, you know, my, my view as a writer is, is that, um, is that I, I have a very blue collar approach to it. I, I, I think of it like, like being a bricklayer. Uh, and my job is to go to the, go to the office, go to the, go to the, the work site, which is here where I'm sitting right now and um, do my job. Um, lay a few bricks, come back the next day, fix the wobbly ones, lay a few more bricks, fix it, you know, and you, um, um, uh, you, and you show up whether you feel like showing up because you have a job to do. Um, my view on that. Um, I, I don't want to have a last word here. So let's, um, let's go around the horn very quickly before we wrap up. Um, one, any, any last thought you all want to leave us with about uh, anything from the role of literature or how to get through uh, a trying time like this or a great recipe, anything. Um, well, I would highly recommend mental health and, you know, however you can manage that. If you can afford a psychologist, that's great. But also just, I know it's boring and overused, but be kind to yourself. We're living through a very traumatic and weird and lonely existential crazy time. So you don't have to pile everything on at once. Um, just, just be gentle. Great advice from, from Lauren. Uh, here's her book. Get a copy. Uh, should we go to Emma? I find it very comforting to read about appalling moments in our history because, you know, um, it does make the horrors of the present day, it puts them in perspective. So yeah, I've totally enjoyed, say, Hilary Mantel's trilogy about Thomas Cromwell, hmm. you know, because compared to the tensions of Tudor London in Henry's court, you know, this, this day feels a bit, you know, livable by comparison. Uh, that's Emma Donahue from London, Ontario. Here's her book. Get this one too, folks. Finally, Steve, you'll give you the last word. I'll just say that uh, there's a big, big difference between the super flu and the stand and the coronavirus. Uh, with the super flu, either you're dead or you're alive. You're one of the fortunate few who's alive. And people need to remember that the co coronavirus, it, it, it's, a, it's a, a virus. It doesn't care about your political party and it doesn't care what bumper sticker you have on your truck. It doesn't care whether you think you're a manly man or whether you, th you, you need to go to your job, but there are things you can do. You can wear a mask, you can socially distance, uh, you can take reasonable precautions. And if you do those things, the chances are very, very good that this will all be in the rear view mirror. Great advice from S Stephen King, author of The Stand. This, this edition is, the, is the, um, the, the unabridged, the uncut version of it, which is, uh, is quite remarkable. It's, um, it's, um, it's, you understand reading this book, what a page, what a page, what a, but you also understand what a page turner, what, a page, what it means to, have a page, to be a page turner, because there's a lot of pages to turn here in that uh, ter terrific, um, compelling, somewhat terrifying book. So uh, let me, let's say one final word of thanks to the folks at Penn Faulkner. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us from around the, uh, literally hundreds of people from around the world. And let's bring on um, uh, 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 Gwydion Sullivan, uh, who is Penn Faulkner's executive director. Here's Gwydion, hey Gwydion, uh, for oh, some final no. words. Uh, yeah, well, I just want to start by offering my immense, immense thanks for Steve, Lauren, Emma, Daniel, you, and uh, of course, Beth Ann. And all of you for making this another incredible literary conversation. We really couldn't do anything we do without your participation. I wanted to close tonight by dropping our donation link back into the chat window. And the, despite what the esteemed Mr. King uh, told us tonight, I happen to believe that at a time when there's so much that's keeping us all separated or even divided from one another, from viruses to politics to culture wars, books can still bring us together. Books have the power to close the distances between one culture and another, one person and another. The right story can make you feel seen and heard and understood and, and that's critical. And that's why we at Penn Faulkner work so hard to put culturally relevant books into the hands of BC students 
who don't always have enough access to stories, even in good times. And in times like these, recent events have made that even more critical and difficult. So even $15 from you can totally transform one young person's reading life with one book. And $15 a month, if you can manage that, can help us do that all year long. So thank you so much for anything you can do, even if it's a, a small, small contribution. And truthfully, thank you for joining us tonight and, and helping complete the circle of this conversation. We're very grateful to have you all.